So it's my pleasure to welcome Josh Goldberg. Um, for those who don't know him, Josh is an associate professor in medical neurobiology at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. Uh, he did his undergraduate degree in physics and then his PhD in uh, computational and systems neuroscience with Abe Bergman and Sompolinsky. Uh, and then after that, he went to Charlie Wilson's lab at uh, UT San Antonio for his postdoc, um, followed by a, a brief period in industry, working in industry on neuromodulation of a different kind, like stimulating the vagus nerve, and then went to an, assist, an assistant professor, research assistant professorship in Jim Surmeyer's lab in Northwestern. Um, so these are really outstanding labs to go to. And then uh, in about 2013, 14, went back to uh, Hebrew University, set up his own lab uh, where he's studying you know, pathophysiology of Parkinson's disease and also the basic science of the basal ganglia using imaging, electrophysiology, and computational modeling techniques. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, Jeff, for that. Is that it? Um, so thank you for that really kind introduction. And also thank, I'd like to thank the TSVP committee. I don't know if it, you know who's here from that committee, but Jonas in their place and Lynn for the amazing, first of all, inviting me and the amazing hospitality. And uh, I sort of envisioned that it's called the Theoretical Sciences Visiting Program. So I kind of envisioned there'd be, a, you know, people with math and physics backgrounds in addition to neuroscientists. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong, but uh, the talk is maybe peppered with a few you know, little mathematical insights that I'm gonna add. So if it's helpful or not. Um, and I was also told it's supposed to be a general audience talk. So I tried to, I thought of you know, people outside the field. So you'll just, if, if you're not from outside the field and you'll just bear with me. Okay, so if you were to uh, first course in neuroscience or maybe computational or neuroscience, um, the first thing they, they teach you when you learned about a, a single neuron is that neurons have a resting membrane potential that's determined by the concentrations of various ions in, inside the cell and outside the cell. And these concentrations are different and through the neurons potential, you end up with a, a membrane potential that's at negative 70. And, and then you're told that if you do an experiment, you probably see this in the textbooks, if you hyperpolarize or depolarize the cells, in this case, it's a spiny neuron in the, in the stratum, um, then you, you'll get the neuron will be hyperpolarized by um, hyperpolarizing current injections and depolarize. And if you depolarize it enough with a large enough current injection, you'll get spikes or action potentials. And then you'll move on to the next study. They'll talk about synaptic context. And they'll tell you that synapses are where neurons talk to each other, and you'll learn about chemical synapses, and you'll learn that chemical synapses can also depolarize um, uh, the, the membrane potential of, an, of uh, the receiving neuron or hyperpolarize it if it's, and, uh, and that'll depend on its reversal potential. So if the reversal potential is above the threshold, it'll be called uh, an excitatory, um, excitatory synapse and if it's it's more hyperpolarized than, than B threshold um, you, you'll it'll be inhibitory and V threshold is that voltage at which the membrane potential stops being sort of linear and you immediately get this regenerative process that gives you the action potential so that's what you're taught and this is a very cortico hippocampo centric kind of view of the brain because the big interesting and the big neurons that people studied all, all behave like that. And even, even some of the neurons in, in the area that I, the brain that I study, the one I showed you, spiny neurons. However, uh, so sorry, here's this definition. I skipped this. So this is a definition both in Wikipedia, but also in this famous book of excitatory versus inhibitory synapses. So here it's written. He said, uh, excitatory is if the uh, reversal is above the threshold and inhibitory if it isn't. And I also wanted to stop this. I like this about this definition. The, the excitatory synapses increase the probability of a spike, right? And they or they decrease the probability. So the idea is that the, the neuron is sitting at its around at around its its uh, 
resting membrane potential, and then it needs inputs to push it up, to increase the chance that it'll likelihood that it'll spike. And here is where I said, I wanna say what they didn't teach us in 101, uh, maybe I'm gonna cheek a little bit, but there are also neurons in the brain and actually many of them that are autonomous pacemaker neurons. Pacemaker is a term borrowed from cardiac physiology where we have a special uh, subclass of myocardia cells that can actually generate their own um, electrical potentials. And those are, that they recruit the entire um, myocardium into an excitable state where it contracts. So we also have neurons that do that. Neurons that um, fire continuously regardless of synaptic inputs. Um, and they actually lack stable resting memory potential. They, you, can't, you can't leave them at a membrane potential, they won't stay put. They'll just move themselves upwards towards a threshold, generate an action potential, hyperpolarize, and then start all over again. So there's no resting membrane potential. And if using the language of, uh, of that previous slide, the probability of finding an action potential is one. It's always gonna be an action potential. Now, as I said, these are ubiquitous. Uh, various neurons that release neuromodulators in the brainstem, and we're studying that in, a, in a, a great thematic program I just happened to be here for, which has been really educational and interesting. You know, prominently dopamine neurons, they fire on their own. Uh, cerebellar Purkinje cells are autonomous pacemakers, various inhibitory interneurons, and, and many of the cells in the basal ganglia. And I'll be mentioning mostly cells of the part of the basal ganglia called the globus pallidus, it's a part of the brain. And, and the substantia mega prize reticulata. Um, for this talk, it's less important to know where they are. It's just that they have this property that they do not have a resting memory potential and that they oscillate continuously. So then what, what do synaptic inputs do to a cell that's gonna fire no matter what? In this case, it can only do essentially one or two things. If we're thinking of weak synaptic inputs, and that's how we like to think about them, it's mostly weak. So here I'm simulating uh, a very famous neuron, actually axon, called the Hodg Hodgkin-Huxley model neuron. This is maybe the first set of differential equations, or definitely in a computational one-on-one course, is the first set of differential equations you're taught to describe uh, excitability of a neuron. And I'm simulating this uh, starting at the peak of an action potential, and then it ramps up and makes another, another peak, and that's sort of the black trace. However, Right here, I, I perturbed in this, this is a simulation on a computer. I, I, I gave a little slight excitatory input, I, something that caused, I'll, I'll have a blow up of this in a second, caused a slight depolarization. And of course that made, not surprisingly, the spike happened a little bit earlier. However, Hodgkin-Huxley neuron, which is a model neuron, has an interesting property that if you do the same thing earlier in the cycle, okay, you depolarize, a little depolarizing pulse, you actually postpone the next action potential. And that has to do with the special dynamics of this neuron. Okay, so you can actually measure, not do this only for two points, you can actually measure, do this measurement throughout the whole cycle and calculate the following quantity. You do a little perturbation, so you let the spike go and you do a little perturbation, here it's blown up, and you, let's say it's called delta V, and, and then you measure by how, but by how much you've delayed or, or advanced the next spike, delta T. And then you, you normalize delta T by delta V. The reason you normalize is you expect that in a very weak, for very weak perturbations, it'll scale. If you give a double the size of the perturbation, you'll get a double the size of the delay. So you scaled it out and you, you calculate this quantity called, uh, it's called the phase response curve. It's how it, the susceptibility of the neuron to perturbations. And we often use the letters capital Z to describe it. And it's a function of the entire phase of the neuron. In this case, it's the, the period of the neuron. And you can see these two measurements I did in the simulation are drawn here. If I, if I depolarize it around there, I get a um, advanced, you know, the, the spike comes earlier and I always mark that as positive, but actually if I hit it over here, it, it postpones the spike. Now this, this curve sort of makes sense. You know, there's a region here, you, you, um, where a neuron is refractory in the middle of the spike, so you can't, any input coming here is zero and also at the end, but there's really interesting stuff going on in the middle. Now, just to point out, there's also the, the solid curve is actually uh, a PRC that you can calculate numerically. If you have the equations of your neuron, like the Hodgkin-Huxley equations, then there's a, there's a method, there's a, there's a numerical method to calculate this whole function straight out. 
programs like XPP can do that. It's called the adjoint method. So this is the this is the full precise phase response curve. But this is around, and you see that it has regions with depolarizing inputs will, will, will advance the spike and regions will delay, delay it. But importantly, this really gives us a, a simple way to describe pacemaking neurons. We actually think about them as a, as a phase oscillator. They have a phase going from zero to one or sometimes zero to two pi. And the equation is really, really easy. It's just the, the, the derivative of, of the phase with time is just a constant. That's the, that's the frequency. And so that's, it's, it seems like a very simple, uh, but it's actually very, very useful, not only theoretically, but also empirically. And this, can, it's, this is sort of a, uni, this is a general universal method. One of the first people who developed was, was Professor Kuramoto here in Japan, who, who described this phase reduction method. Take any kind of oscillator, this is a clock, a heart, some sort of, um, limit cycle in a physical system and you can reduce it. If it has this limit cycle, it goes through, um, then, then, you can, uh, then you can describe it as a phase oscillator. Okay, so then the description becomes sort of easy because the, the rule is if you're at the, at the limit of weak perturbations, uh, the idea is that any perturbation, just as I showed you, all it can do is really advance or, or delay the next spike. You're, you're disregarding huge perturbations you know, that would like just throw if I took that Hodgkin Huxley mount and, and, and injected a huge current, it would go into some depolarization block and you'd have to wait several seconds for it to come back. We're not we're talking about not talking about anything like that. We're talking about very weak things. So all really all they can do is change the phase. Um, and so then the description of the neuron is really easy. It has its own frequency, it's it's or or, or which is the reciprocal of its period. And it has a phase response curve that tells you how susceptible it is to perturbations at various phases. And the idea is that you Assume this is, is linear for small perturbations, it's, lin it's linear with phase. So then the, the, the equation is the same equation we started off with. This is the unperturbed oscillator. And you just add a term where the perturbation in time is multiplied times the risk, this uh, um, susceptibility quantity called the phase, phase response curve. So we've taken a whole neuron and reduced it to, two, to one, to a scalar and to maybe a, a vector, a phase, phase of the period. Now this quantity can also be measured experimentally. And I'm just giving you an example from a paper of mine. This actually isn't a pacemaker. This is an actual pyramidal neuron you can see. So I, in order to make it act like a pacemaker, I had to depolarize it. And I actually depolarized it quite a lot to get, uh, maybe this recording wasn't so great. Gilly, you can tell me. But um, the idea is you can do the same thing. You can let this self fire and then give, you know, its phase kind of changes with it randomly. And it's noisy, and you give a pulse every a very brief pulse at a, at a set time because but because the neuron sort of visits all its phases, you can eventually collect the effects of your phase um, relative to what you'd expect. So you let's say average the, the spikes before the actual the actual cycle when you're perturbing it. You average that, and then you say, okay, that should have been this. It should have spiked spike based on these roughly where the dotted line is and the dashed line and it actually spiked there and I calculate and you see you get a pretty noisy estimate but you get a rough idea the closer you are to the spike threshold um, you you advance the spike much more and maybe perhaps there's a region where you actually delay spikes um, I don't think anybody in the field has made a convincing argument about any kind of neuron that it actually has this negative region I tried to make that claim about GP neurons and in a paper I'll show you but I mean, they're likely to be wrong. So you can actually measure this, and it's it's something that you can do within a single experiment. It's not, not very complicated. Okay. Now the other thing about the nice thing about the phase response is that it's a periodic function, the phase response curve, right? It's a periodic function of the period. And using Fourier theory, we can we can decompose this the shape of the phase response curve into its its fund its Fourier mode. So this might be an exercise from a you know first or second year course in um, calculus where, where you learn about Fourier theory and they'll give you this function in this case a, tri a triangle and the, you'll have to calculate the modes and the modes are have multiples of a single um, period or, or actually it's um, you know you have a full period half a period a third of the period a quarter of the period but uh, you have a discrete set of uh, modes and they each have their amplitude and they also have their phase shift. You know, where, where is the peak of that, of that mode? So you, for this triangular function, you can calculate that the amplitude sort of drops off 
here um, and a polynomial, I mean, one over n squared or something in the phase here in this example moves, changes linearly. And you can use these modes to reconstruct this, this function. This applies to phase, phase response curves. And I'll just point out that this triangular model is actually pretty reasonable for a lot of neurons. Uh, so that's why we use it as a toy model. So I actually proposed this in a certain uh, paper I, sh I showed you that the, the easiest way, the most straightforward way to calculate a phase response curve is to per perturb it along its uh, phase and then collect all your perturbations and, 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 and plot them, scatter plot them. But I, I thought that perhaps if, what if I actually try to estimate the, the, the Fourier modes directly, give the right stimulus in order to uh, calculate those modes, the, 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 uh, the, the, the prefactors of those modes. So if here's an example, this is the famous integrated fire neuron, which is the easiest, neuron. again, in a course in computational neuroscience, it might be the first model they'll use. It's called the peak model from 1905, I think, where you basically assume that you have a exponential um, line to a threshold, then you have a spike and you repeat it. So the, the, the sub-threshold voltage is simply this exponential curve of the black one. And now, instead of giving perturbation, I give a per perturbation that spans the entire uh, the entire period, and it's, it's a sine wave. And I can calculate, um, I can calculate what will happen over an entire period. Uh, you know, what kind of, what kind of, what kind of change in the threshold I'll get. Now, um, I've shown you here that the, uh, this is actually what the IPRC looks like. You can calculate it analytically. It's the easiest one because it's a, integrated fire neuron. So you can see that if the, the, the input has a, it's pretty symmetrical in terms of current. It has a positive and negative that cancels out. But because the positive part happens when the phase response is small and the negative part is when it happens, it's larger, then you actually get a delaying of the spike, right? Because you've injected more in its phase where it's more responsive, you've injected a negative current. But if you look at this, and then you can take the equation and calculate what, what should that phase be? If I give a small, small perturbation, then it should be, according to this equation, I basically should take the, uh, disregard the V, just the, the Z function and integrate it with the sine wave. And then I get the result. This is what my, my, my delay should be. But if you look at this mathematically, this is the def definition of the Fourier transform of the Z function. This is the first, the sine transform of the PRC, okay? And, and by the way, just if you were, didn't, didn't know anything about this theory and you just were given this exercise to what would a sine wave do to, a, to this integrator, to a linear integrator, that you would do, this would be the calculation, the, the, the solution of the differential equation. You'd see that this term coming from solving a linear differential equation is actually, turns out to be the phase response curve, exactly this. It's an exponential, exponential you know, uh, increase with the tau as the time scale of the integrated fire neuron. Okay, so I, in order to test whether this made any sense, I actually used an electronic oscillator where I could read the manual and figure out what it's, what it's um, you know, how, voltage, how, it volt, how its voltage changes with time. And I could actually calculate, and I know that I can calculate a phase response curve. And I tried both methods. One, one is I, I actually, I took and built this little circuit and connected it to the same amplifiers I have for my physiological experiments. And I, I did the same thing. I either perturbed small perturbations, individual perturbations. I collected these star, these asterisks, asterisks or whatever. Or I did the same. I injected these sine waves and got, and I, 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 I tried to reconstruct the, the, the actual function from these sine waves. You see it, it, it approximates it. The more, more I, the more I calculate, the more it works. Now, of course, this is a very discontinuous function. So it's going to require many, many, uh, uh, many, many modes to reconstruct, but that's usually not the case for a real neuron. But here I show you that the, the actual values of the first modes theoretically and, and from the experiment turn out to be the same. And then I went on and I went back to the cortical pyramidal neuron um, and I tried to do, I compared the two methods. So here I gathered all the spikes and here I actually reconstructed, you know, I think three or four modes and you get a really nice representation a smooth representation of the phase response curve. Okay, so I've shown you two ways to do it. Uh, and if you notice, the, the first way I did it actually is a little bit problematic. Uh, those of you probably noticed that here at the very end, you, you hit this sort of, it's called the causal limit. If you're really close to the spike and you, you'll always get this 
clearly non-smooth sort of barrier you hit against because the closer you are, you immediately generate a spike. And that's sort of not very, not very helpful. So people have developed um, a, another method to actually just inject the neuron with, with white or nominally white noise, the Gaussian kind of current or conductance. And, and then you get a, I won't describe it, you get a, it becomes a regression problem. You can actually regress the shape of the phase response curves. And these are two, these are two GP, globus pallidus neurons that we, that were recorded at, by Charlie Wilson in his own lab in Texas. Um, uh, and I'll show that in a moment. Th these are actual, you know, phase response curves that he, he recorded to two different GP neurons. So there's this heterogeneity in the shape of, the, of their phase response curves. Um, this is a book that sort of explains a lot of that uh, from about 10 years ago. Um, so you see here, you don't have this, usually don't have this problem of, of the limit. It, even if it goes all the way to the end, you don't hit that limit and you can get nice, nice uh, calculations. So, so okay, so I've, I've told you about this. Now, why, why, why should we care? Why should I care about this? You know, I'm, I'm more interested in hippocampus or, sorry. Okay, so, I'm gonna show you an example of how this phase reduction approach really helps to explain the precise timing of neurons in response to periodic, to periodic input. So I'll show you that we can record a neuron subjected to, to periodic inputs. So on the other hand, calculate its phase response curves and show you an incredible co correspondence between the prediction of the model to what you actually measure. That, and that's a paper that just came out. It was a project I did, I'm finishing a sabbatical this year. I actually started with, with Charlie Wilson. And I've mentioned his name a number of times. He's, he has a series of papers about this. And, yeah, and I really, if anybody's interested, you know, he's the person to follow in terms of somebody who actually taken this tool that was initially theoretical for theoreticians and has really used it in the lab to study a lot of basal ganglia neurons. Okay, so I wanna talk about periodic input. You, you all know that periodic input is relevant in the, in the brain and in, in perception, episodic memory. There are also two cases I'm definitely not an expert on that, but you can read about this. Um, we know that there's rhythmic activity in the basal ganglia, which is the part of the brain that, that I study, um, and Jeff studies and Gilly studies and other people here in this symposium uh, in the medic uh, program study. And there's also, what's interesting about oscillations is sometimes they're pathological. So here's a recording from a guy Bergman's lab, which Jeff mentioned I was his PhD student. It was done before I joined the lab in the, in the mid or late 90s, um, and it's, it's, these are recordings with multi, multiple electrodes in a primate brain, uh, in a healthy monkey, again, okay, the globus pallidus, and then a monkey that was rendered Parkinsonian with, inje with an injection of a neurotoxin called MPTP, and you see, you very clearly see that the firing becomes sort of oscillatory, and actually, I've done these experiments in his lab. When you, when you it actually, you really hear, it. you hear the, 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 you know, it's five, seven hertz oscillations, sometimes high. People have even seen this in slices or in, I don't know if they, slice or in vivo, work by Mark Bevin. Okay, and of course, also the, one of the therapeutic therapies for Parkinson's is to use deep brain stimulation, which is you're imposing a, a oscillatory input onto the brain. And so it's sort of important to understand how, how neurons will respond to oscillatory input. So Charlie had done, uh, and actually he did these experiments himself. I just came and analyzed it and I came up with the idea of, but these are his actual recordings. He used a technique called perforated patch where you, you, you create a seal onto, with, a, with a pipette onto a cell, but it, it, it permeates and allows certain ions, but it doesn't, so it doesn't disrupt the in, in, in intracellular milieu of the cell. And you can get very, very long recordings and you'll see how long the recordings he did. And he subjected each one of these cells, these 16 cells to a se sequence of oscillatory inputs ranging from one Hertz to hundred Hertz in you know, one, two, three, four, every single frequency for one, every one for 10 seconds. So that's a thousand seconds um, with breaks in between. So it's a very long recording, but the recordings are stable. And, and so here you see in every panel, what is the frequency current? And it's about a, you can see, I think it says 20 picoamps amplitude, very small current oscillatory. And you see how it, or it, the, the cells being recorded in current clamps, you see it spikes and you see that the spikes sort of arrange themselves in specific ways. And then you can ask yourself, let me, I know the phase of the oscillation in each one of these, when do the spikes occur? Uh, 
during when this happens, and you can see that they kind of in some cases spread out, but it's not homogeneous. So in this low frequency, when I say low frequency, it's much lower than the intrinsic firing of the neuron. You get this sort of cosine sinusoidal modulation of the peak here. Same thing if you go to high frequency, a little bit different. And then there's a sweet spot when you're not surprisingly driving the cell at a frequency that's close to its own autonomous rate, then you actually see that this distribution becomes very narrow and the phases don't change much. So we, we have something we call phase locking. So, so the question is, can we explain, can we explain why, why it looks like this? Why do we get, you know, why do we get this phase locking? Why, do, why does the sinusoidal, um, yeah, it's sinusoidal, or this sort of sinusoidal modulation phase, why does this, you know, spike phase distribution look that way? Okay, so in order, I'm going to try to convince you that yes, we can we can do this actually really well. So, how do how do we solve this? So we go back to this equation. So again, we have our phase response curve. We have the firing um, of the neuron, and we now we're subjecting it to some input. We have written cosine. We actually use sine in this experiment, but doesn't matter. And so you have a you have a stimulation frequency which may be different from your uh, your intrinsic frequency, and then you you start you ask yourself okay if i started at a certain phase theta i of the of the oscillation let me integrate this perturbation this input throughout the whole cycle and see what change in when do i reach you know a spike a phase one and i and i can do that for every single theta i i can start at a different i can start the cycle with one spike at any phase of the oscillation and and, and predict where the next phase will be and you can sort of draw a map, theta i versus theta i plus one, plus one. And let's say it turns out looking like this blue curve. So I've, I've you know, figured out that, uh, that this is, the, this is the, the, the result for each one of these um, calculations. Now, what, what what, what, how do I use this to reconstruct to understand the, the firing? Suppose I, my, I, my, the neuron fired at phase 0.9 over here, um, OK? So this curve tells us where it'll spike next, right? It, 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 next, next cycle, it'll, it'll spike at 0. 0.6. So I can reflect this off the diagonal to find the next one, right? And that'll be the next phase. And I can reflect it again, and that's the next phase, and so on ad infinitum. And you see that it all converges to a specific phase where they actually I'll have phase locking. At this phase, when the neuron fires at this phase of the firing, it'll also fire at the same phase at the next at the next step, and that's where you'll get phase, phase locking. Okay, so one of the interesting things we kind of figured out um, in, in this in this study is that uh, well, I, I mean, aspect of what we figured out is that the, when what, if you if you take a neuron and calculate its this return map, right? Now it's turned to the phi, it should be theta. It doesn't matter phi previous, phi next. If you calculate these things, you, you realize you need to calculate them from the phase response curve. And you see that for each phase response curve, you end up getting a different point where, where you get locking. Now, I should mention, it's written here, that in this, I'm, I'm using the simple case where I'm actually driving the, the oscillator with the exact frequency, its own intrinsic frequency, so that it's easier to understand. So obviously, we expect to have locking. That's what the solution shows you. You get these crossings, but you see that the phase of the phase response curve tells you when you'll you'll synchronize. If you have a more skewed to the right phase response curve, you'll synchronize earlier in the cycle. And if it's more symmetrical, it'll be in the middle. I mean, that's obvious. A symmetry, it has to be the middle if it's if it's in the middle over here. Now, just to look, uh, but but we discovered something a little more interesting. Is again, this is only the case where uh, we're driving at the same frequency. I'll expand it later. Is that there's a way to figure out sort of geometrically where your phase response curve is supposed to sit. In order to do that, assume that our input is a sine wave at some frequency. And just let me draw its ghost cousin or brother or partner, the cosine that goes with it, okay? So the input is the sine wave. So here I've shown you the phase response curve and I've calculated its first uh, mode. And I've shown you where the spikes happen in the beginning and the end, the action potentials. So it turns out the, the, the neuron will lock in this very specific case exactly where its first mode coalesces or meets with the cosine. Okay, that's where that's where you'll have this. So the, the spike will actually fire here. Uh, the neuron will fire after the peak of the sine wave both here and here. But I can find that by 
fitting the first mode of the phase response curve to the cosine ghost of the sine wave. And just to see why that is, this is the equation. Imagine I want to integrate it until I get to the number one to, and to figure out when I reach phase one. So I integrate this over a period. This first term is frequency times period, which is one. And then I have this additional perturbation term, but all this is equal to one. This means that this perturbation has to be equal to zero, right? I actually want to put that phase response curve will sit at a place where the sine wave will actually summation of its perturbation will be zero phase. It won't add anything. And that means that I'll always stay at the same phase. Now, if you look at this, this equation, in order for this to be an equation, I have a sine wave integrated times a function, right? So if you learn the theory of the Fourier theory, you know that the only way that this function needs to be orthogonal to the sine wave. And because it's a periodic function, and this is where I said I pepper with a little bit of math, it's got all these modes, all the higher frequencies are already guaranteed to be um, uncorrelated, uh, yeah, uncorrelated or orthogonal. But if, if the, specifically the first fundamental mode of the PRC will has to, has to be the cosine wave in order for this to be zero because an integral of sine times cosine of the same frequency, doesn't matter what phrase you start, is zero. So that's, that's the intuition. Okay, and of course, that's, that's under the precise uh, assumption that the period is exactly the phase. And so it turns out to be with real life small perturbations is a little bit of a shift. It's not exactly correct, but it gives you, gives you the intuition. And this, is a, this, was a, this was a toy model. Um, here, I'm using one of the re re reconstructions from Charlie's data. So, okay, we can, he, his actual data, I'm not showing you the data points, but this was the fit to the data point. Um, I should mention Eric Olivares, who's the first author. He did all sort of the analysis and all the of all the, all this work. So you see that again, even though these, this is a real empirical IPRC, but it actually will you expect it to synchronize exactly like this triangular one because they kind of have the same the same first Fourier mode. So even though the different functions, their first fundamental mode is shared, is similar. So you expect them actually under when you're driving them at the at the same frequency you expect them to lock at the same place and this is exactly what we show here this i've already shown you for the toy model but these again are real data now these are again i'm reminding you these are two different experiments on the left and the right then on the left is the calculation at the beginning or the end of the experiment where he did the phase response curve by injecting noise and here he drew, we took the experiment where he drove the one frequency, which, which was close, the driving was closest to its intrinsic frequency. And we plot the points, let's say with this blue uh, neuron, we plot the points that occurred in its real return map. I mean, you can just calculate what the phase is for the actual data. And you see that in both cases, you know, you see a cloud here. That's exactly where the blue curve, which is calculated from this fits. Okay, so this was one experiment. We fit a curve, use the blue curve to calculate this return map. And it crosses somewhere very close to where the, cloud of points are that we collect empirically later on, a few minutes later, when we drive this neuron the same frequency. And the same thing happens when you, you have heterogeneity, you have another kind of neuron with a, it's a GP neuron, same part of the brain, but it's, it's a different, has a different phase response curve. And again, we get this agreement, the, the predicted return map intersects the diagonal over here and, and the points all or less. So that's, I, to me, I mean, I think this is really super elegant. Uh, um, Okay, so now what happens when you're not when you're not in that sweet spot where you're driving? What about the other frequencies? So here's just an example in another paper. I'm just taking a measurement demonstrated. So here we had a case where it was this Sancho Niger reticulata neuron and it's firing, and we actually drove it a little bit lower than its intrinsic frequency. So what we got was, and in this case, this, the blue line is just a fit. It's not, it's not, there's no, we didn't calculate PRCs here. We didn't know, think about it. But we, just, just a, this is just a scatter plot of all the return, all the, the sequence of, of thetas that, 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 as they occur. But what, would, what, what do you expect would happen here? So here, using the same kind of trick, what, what kind of dynamics do you, what kind of phases do you expect? To, what kind of distribution do you expect? So this, you do the same thing. You go from here, and that you reflect that off the diagonal and it takes you over there and you reflect it over the diagonal and you go on ad infinitum and you see that you're basically getting no locking. You're just getting a, getting a whole scatter. But, but the point is that it's not, this is not uniform. It, it can be close to you. It, it isn't necessarily uniform. So for instance, 
this example in the middle you've already seen, but I'll maybe go come back to it in a second. Again, I'm reminding you that these are real, let me explain again. These blue curves are extracted from the fit of the phase response curve. The, the points are actual measurements from the, the, from the spikes that occurred when we drove them with current, when Charlie drove them with current. And, and what you see happens, okay, sorry. And, 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 and this distribution is sort of the, you know, collecting bidding and collecting all these phases that occur. So you see that we have, uh, we have, we get this, I'll talk about the black curve in a second. You get this non-homogeneous, uh, distribution is close to homogeneous, but you basically get, um, you know, something else. But notice that the reason you have, it's not very clear. There are better examples. The reason that this is a little bit higher than here is because your curve is clo closer to the, to, the, uh, to the diagonal. That means that sort of the cell is lingering. If you remember those sort of, uh, you know, L-shaped motion here, when you're close to this curve, you're lingering here a little bit longer. So you're collecting more phases the closer you are, to, even if you don't have locking. So that causes it to kind of become uh, non-homogeneous. And here we have the case of locking. And the black curve, what, what we did to the, the black curve was just to, um, was, to rec was to actually disregard the red points, the data points, take the blue curve that we collected and just add some noise. We estimated the noise in the locking position and sort of added that to the blue line. And then we said, if we added you know, noise sort of like this, then you know, estimate what, what, what this distribution should look like from the phase response curve and assuming some noise and we see we get it kind of predicts pretty well. And we, we showed across, you know, many, many cells that, you know, we, the correlation between this sort of predicted um, um, distribution, the one, the actual distribution is very 0.7 or something you can see in the paper across all frequencies and all neurons. So it fits pretty well. Okay. So what does this have to do with real life, okay. Um, so, I, so I, I mentioned uh, Parkinson's disease, and I also mentioned Chagai Bergman's measurements for the globus pallidus in, in Parkinsonian primates. And uh, we think that this experiment, Charlie's experiment, can actually help explain some conundrum in the data. I, and I, I think, in my vision, you know, maybe Gilad will comment on this or. Uh, Jeff, I think I think this is a conundrum that also drove a lot of really really good science, and I'll tell you I'll tell you what I mean. Um, so, but just as an aside or a segue, I'm going to remind you that techniques to rec uh, to calculate the correlation between spike trains, series of spikes, were were developed in the '60s, sometimes earlier, and we were taught to calculate this cross correlation or something called the cross intensity function. I'm not gonna go in, into it, but it's, it's, it, the result is that it tells you around the time of a spiking of one neuron, what's the rate of the other neuron or, or the number of occurrences. And you can see, and this is a simulation from a famous paper by Perkel um, showing um, what the cross correlation would look like between two neurons that are driven by a common input. So they, you expect them to have a peak at, at around zero because they fire to, they're driven by the same oscillatory input. This is an example from the paper. This is from the paper, and 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 they get the symmetrical cross correlation. So we're taught to think symmetrical cross correlations mean common input, and indeed, a guy when he did this experiment. So the, 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 I should say the interesting finding is, and I'm not I'm not talking about it. Maybe the more striking finding is that healthy primates, when you calculate their spiking in their globus pallidus and you calculate the cross correlations, they're absolutely flat. So that's a fascinating, you know, result that's sort of has kept a lot of people wondering and thinking and people models. Also, Charlie has a, thing, a nice paper about that. But, the, but when the animals become Parkinsonian, they, they start to exhibit beta oscillations. And then you, you, you can calculate the cross correlations between the neurons. And sure enough, they, you, you, get, you get a cross correlation at zero. However, with another pair, you get a different phase. And with another pair, you actually get like a 90 degrees phase. And in this case, you have an antiphase. So he records hundreds of neurons and, and, and several simultaneously, you know, eight or 16. And so he can calculate cross correlations. And he discovers in the same region, you get correlations that are in phase, anti phase, all sorts of phases. And he had a distribution. And this is a paper from 1995. And, I, and, and um, I think a lot of people wondered about this. And they said, well, if this is happening in Parkinsonism, something must be happening to the network, right? Because why, you know, why are, if, 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 you know, sorry, I just borrowed from my own 
review. If we just think of this direct pathway, the GP gets its input from all neurons of the GP get their input roughly from spine neurons that are all have the same synaptic delay, rough mark. Why are we getting these phase delays? So people, you know, people thought maybe we have to look at the other example that Perkel told us about. He said that you can get asymmetric cross correlations if you have a, a situation like this, if there's a longer latency, you know, between the source, let's say the stratum and GP1 and GP2, then maybe, or, 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 or somehow the direct connectivity between them changes, maybe that'll give you uh, a way to explain why these, these phases are different. I, I, th I mean, I may be over-interpreting it, but study, you know, a lot of studies of, of, in, in slice work have looked at you know, what happens in models of Parkinsonism to, to connectivity within the basal ganglia. And again, it might be just me, but I think there was a connection between, I think that result sort of led people to think that there must be changes. And there are plastic changes. I mean, there, there, there are, but, but um, okay. So the question is, are, the, are those changes, is it true? Do you really need to have changes in connectivity in order to explain this change in the, in the, in the and in here, this is a lot to look at, but just look at the middle, at the middle column first, and then maybe we'll look at the others. So what, what we did was we said, okay, Charlie recorded these 16 cells on different slices, different days, but they're all subjected to the same input. So we can imagine that we recorded them simultaneously. We can take each pair and it was recorded simultaneously with the same input. We can calculate in, gr in green, it's cross intensity function. Okay, so, um, you know, just, Take all the spikes in that experiment and, and calculate, as Perkel taught us, the cross intensity, and that's the that's the green line. But then the flip way to think about it is to say, wait a minute, these are all somehow firing in a specific phase, and we know that the heterogeneity of neurons causes them to fire each of different phases um, of the input, right? Because the, the heterogeneity and the phase response curves makes them fire differently. So. What you actually, you can show mathematically, and I just, it's a one line calculation in the paper is that the, 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 the cross correlation under the constraints where you're measuring, you know, the cross correlation, let's say in, in the first period of the cycling, the cross correlation function should be, just be a convolution of these two distributions. I showed you those distributions earlier. Okay, so you can calculate these uh, distributions empirically, convolve them and get a prediction of what the spike correlation should look like. And it actually has to be exactly the same thing. And you see, it's very, it's easier to see that this happens when you have these very distinct distributions because these were, this middle column was taken when, when the driving frequency was close to the intrinsic frequency. But, but actually this intuition of convolving the, the distributions I showed you, even the very non-impressive ones, but the ones that are non-uniform, when you convolve them, they, they explain even sometimes more, you know, more detail of, of, of cross-correlation than you'd expect. So, what this basically means is that, um, you know, we've actually shown that, that, look at this case, you can, neurons that are driven by the same input can have very big or very dramatic changes in their phase, phase relationships, even though they're receiving common input. Okay, and, and this is an extreme example. I don't think uh, the, the beta oscillations are not at the intrinsic firing rates, so they're a little bit lower. But, and it's true that if you're very low rates, you tend to get uh, in phase and you, and you know, maybe at higher rates, you get more, but, but so it's not perfect, but at least a proof of concept, you see that even in an unsubjective, the same input. So let's say in Parkinsonism, the whole brain becomes oscillatory just by virtue of the fact that these neurons, GP, ha have different phase response curves. They're, they're, and, and so their heterogeneity is expressed by different phase response curves. You expect them to fire at different phases and therefore their cross correlation should not necessarily be around zero. And then the rest of the paper, which I won't go into, um, um, Eric Olivares did simulations where he nevertheless simulated all sorts of architectures of GP and he, he, he changed and he saw that adding GP interactions weaken, makes lowers the amplitude of these in general, the general results, they lower the amplitude of these phase response curves, but they don't really, uh, sorry, these cross correlation functions, but they don't really change their phase. So the phase really seems to be an intrinsic uh, property. So um, I'll, I'll just, I'll, either this is the, I, I think I still have some more time, right? I mean, or, I mean, I, you know, about five or 10 minutes or something like that. Okay, so, th so this, the, this is the main part of the talk. Um, 
phase response curve determined at what phase the GP neuron will lock to a oscillatory drive with a frequency similar to the intrinsic range of the neuron. That was the first part of what I talked about. The phase response curve determined the spike phase distribution when there's no locking. We can, we can extract that. When driving two neurons with the same oscillatory input, the spikes, spike cross correlogram can be calculated from the spike phase distributions, right? That convolution. So we can go calculate the phase response curve once we know the distribution. And, and uh, importantly, the cross correlograms of uncoupled GP neurons because they're recorded in different days and different grains, but driven by the same input can display broad distribution of phase delays, particularly when uh, they're driven near their intrinsic frequency. And we think that this could explain the appearance of wide distribution of phase delays among GP neuron par Parkinson primates is to be expected even for common input and no need to infer you know, Oakham's razor, we don't need to infer changes in connectivity. So that's sort of the main part of the talk. If I have a few more minutes, I, I, because the title spoke about dendrites, I'll just say, okay, we come back to the computation neuroscience 101, and then the, stu the, the, bright, you know, the brightest student in the class will say, okay, yeah, great. So you, but what about dendrites? Neurons have dendrites, and you need to, you know, to, to represent dendrites, you have to have a multi-compartmental model, and and, and you know, inputs coming distally are gonna be different from inputs coming proximally. Uh, can, your, can the phase model account for that? So, so of course, if you have a multi-compartmental model of a neuron and you, then you have a dynamical system explaining this part of the dendrite. And then you can, if you remember, I told you about this adjoint method, you could simulate it. You could use the adjoint method and calculate what the phase response curve for every point is. But, but that's also experimentally not something we can do. But one, uh, one result that I had derived in a paper, oh gosh, it's almost 20 years ago, was that if we take a simple model um, of, of, a, of an oscillator and we connect, in this case, a, a linear dendrite, but I, I'll, I'll also say that this, um, I'll expand it in a second. Basically, if a soma has a phase response curve, because it's, it's, it's a Hodgkin Huxley, so it has this funny shape phase response curve, the dendrite is sort of, you know, cable theory teaches us that it will be, it'll have a Green's function, it'll have a linear filter that represents perturbations advancing the dendrite. So the, the phase response curve at a certain point along the dendrite is simply going to be the convolution of, of this somatic phase response curve. If this is the only oscillating thing and the dendrite. And we show that it can be exp expanded to nonlinearity. The reason is, is again, if you assume that perturbations are weak, then Nonlinear dendrites can be linearized, and then they they have actually very general kind of behaviors. Either they amplify or they they resonate, but you can do a linear approximation, and you can include it in this formalism. So, for instance, here's a simulation. You see that if this is the um, this is that a phase response curve for the Hodgkin Huxley, or maybe it's a different model. I've shown you different size perturbations and the adjoint. If I move out along the dendrite, you know half a, a, a um, space constant, the full space constant you see that the filters change and then the phase response curves kind of move to the left, which is you'd expect. If a, if a perturbation occurs distally, it needs time to kind of percolate to the, or to the soma. So you expect the peak to go away, but you also see that it also filters away. If the soma had this nice negative region, if you go far enough away, the phase response curve in the dendrite no longer has, has that region. Um, okay, so just to say that we also recently developed a, uh, a method, not perfect, but a, a, we, a method to measure these dendritic phase response curves to see if they, and it really, it, it, it was, we couldn't do a lot better than this. What we were able to do is we were able to patch a neuron and then direct, uh, sorry, a neuron that expresses channel rhodopsin, okay? So ion channel that when you, when you illuminate with blue light, you depolarize the cell. So we would have liked to have done this, you know, to be able to light, specific points. And I first tried that with two photon excitation of channel depth and it didn't work for various reasons. So we settled for something like this. We would either constrict the band of illumination, you know, parasomatically just to the proximal dendrites or, or illuminate the entire dendritic tree. And the, 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 to show a proof of concept that when inputs are also distal, you, could, you should be able to integrate across the whole dendrite and get, um, and get, and get a different result. And, and you know, we, as we said, the phase response, the phase response could should be shifted. And I think I show that here. So this is, we actually, we, again, the, these are SNR neurons. This triangle I mysteriously showed at the beginning has actually turned out to be one of the best ways to describe, at least with the method we used optogenetically, uh, 
And when we fit, uh, we fit the phase response curve induced by perturbations, either just perisomatically or to the entire dendritic arbor, you see that we actually get that shift to the left that you expect. You know, if, if I parameterize this triangle by where its peak occurs from zero to one, then, then this shifted to the left. And then we went back and did similar experiments to what, um, what, I, what Charlie had done with the GP. We did this a few years ago with the SNR, again, gamma site and recordings. Um, so uh, you can look at the paper, but the point is that here we drove the neurons near their, near their intrinsic fre frequency, and we generated the similar distributions and the similar return maps. And the point was um, that, sorry, before I show you that, you could see in the return maps the shift. So when you illuminate full field stimulation, because you have the shift of the phase response curve, the, the locking happens you know, more at 0 0.6, and here it happens closer to 0 0.1. It's a small effect, but measurable. And then we actually collected, um, you know, the the, um, the distribution of, uh, of of phases, the average of, for every cell. What's the average phase where it locked? And we just put them all together. You could see for proximal illumination, sort of the, the average grand average is around here, and for the full field, it's shifted. There's a little bit of a change in the frequency. So it's a proof of concept that the dendrites introduce this phase delay, which is not surprising. And the final thing I'll just Flash that you is to show you that we've extend. This is already not using phase response, but this method of illuminating proximally versus distally, we also use to study cholinergic interneurons in the striatum that are also pacemakers, but that's less important here. And just to study those nonlinear properties of their dendrites, okay, because we know they're nonlinear, we expanded, you know, we use the same, we gave it a chirp of light. So we changed the light from zero hertz to 20. And we can record the currents in the soma and voltage clamp, and we kind of could fit um, in the in, in 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 Fourier space and frequency space the best you know curve. And, and just I mean, I, I, if it's interesting, interesting, you can go look at the paper. But here's an interesting experiment that if we added TTX, which blocks sodium channels, and and we calculate um, what is the proximal um, filter filter that represents the proximal illumination, you see that TTX reduces its amplitude, whereas you sort of get either the opposite effect or no effect with the full field. And that sort of suggests that you must have more, more, um, uh, more of an effect of sodium currents, I mean, persistent sodium currents on dendrites proximally. So one prediction would be, um, and is that we know roughly that, that, uh, um, and, and, and recently there's been a nice physiological demonstration of this by, by Chris Ford's gr group is that we know that thalamic input, these neurons receive two kinds of excitatory inputs from the thalamus, from the cortex. So if we either, you know, you either inject channel reduction to the thalamus and then it'll cause the axons in the stratum to express channel reduction and we can flash light and, and stimulate the cholinergic interneurons, we can do, or we can use an animal that expresses channel reduction and cortical inputs and do the same thing. Then we asked when will renolazine, which is supposed to be a selective um, antagonist of persistent sodium currents, when will it affect the amplitude of the, uh, the EPSP? And we saw that when you do it um, for cortical input, which is supposed to terminate more distally, um, we go, don't get an effect. But whereas when you, when you stimulate thalamic inputs, you get an EPSP that is modulated more by, by, by a, a, a blocker of, of potassium sorry, so, uh, sodium current. So the idea is that this sort of demonstrates that there's, there's uh, inhomogeneity of, of, of sodium currents, that they're more, they're more proximally located on phonogenic interneuron dendrites. So this you know, is, is also useful to study biophysics. So just to sum up, um, another part of this course in competition in Neuroscience 101 is that you learn the Hodgkin-Huxley formalism, which I mentioned, and it was the Nobel, they received the Nobel Prize. And, and they taught us how to, how to calculate the biophysics of neurons. So we have to do a lot of uh, voltage clamp experiments to sort of, here's an A current from a paper of ours. You have to calculate all the currents in a very controlled voltage clamp way. And then you, a mathematical description of all your conductances. And this is that same equation I showed you, the simulation of Hodgkin Huxley. And then you go, and of course, I've just used this is not a and this is not a Hodgkin Huxley, these are real neurons. Then you want to, in theory, take everything you learned and use your model to explain 
all this you know wonderful activity and here these aren't these are these are pacemakers but they also do wonderful stuff but that's that's sort of what they taught us to do you know voltage clamp modeling predict what you see in, in, in current clamp this is of course a very daunting task and you know if you're a graduate student you may be able to do one current in one cell you know and and to describe the whole neuron is really complicated and and therefore this approach of using prcs gives you a, in a single experiment you can kind of collect a lot of information about, about the biophysics, the important biophysics for spiking, and make really, really good predictions about when it's actually going to spike, which is really the signal we often really, really care about. Um, so that this is actually sort of the summary of my talk, is this take-home take -home message. Um, so here's my lab in, in Jerusalem. Um, but this the project I should... So um, Snap did the, 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 the part about... Um, at the very end, when I showed you the, how to study the nonlinearity of the phonology continuum, that was Snat's, he was the lead author on that. And um, the work I showed you about GP neurons, the data were collected by Charlie and the simulations by Eric Olivares, and I was sort of the guy who was trying to direct what we should do with the data. Maybe I did some of the calculations. Um, Leo Tiroshi is a postdoc with Daniel Dombek now, and she, she did that work demonstrating the the two the possibility of illuminating proximal versus distal parts of a dendritic tree using light and i think i've mentioned everybody oh yeah so thank you very much time for some questions Um, so how would the PRCs in such a model change if the dendrites would have some active mechanisms or, or did it already have any active mechanisms? Oh, so, 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 so in the original paper, we, we asked that question. It's a, it, we added, a, in, it was easier to calculate analytically if we, we just assumed there's a sort of a semi-infinite table and, and, and a homogeneous distribution. We show that exactly what I tried, very quickly said is that Nonlinearities collapse in if you if you assume that input is weak, you can linearize them and they, they give you one of two kinds of responses, either amplification, like persistent sodium will amplify. Um, and there's actually a great uh, review from 2000 by Yossi Arom categorizing, but, or it, it can be a resonating, you know, um, occurrence. So those are the two effects you can get, but those are still linear effects, you know, amplification and, and, and resonance. So you actually can the, the the linear filter that describes the dendrite the dendrite can still be expanded. It'll, it'll have weird shapes. It won't just be sort of this Lorentzian falling off. It'll have interesting little peaks and all sorts of stuff. Uh, and that's also we 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 investigated that with the cohesion continuum. If you go to that paper, let's see, we saw that the HCN current, the H current, is a restorative current. It's a current that induces um, oscillation. Um, resonances. So we show that if you do these experiments holding the cell at negative 70, you see the effect of the, uh, when you illuminate, you see the effect of the HCN, you know, generating actually negative phases and, 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 and Fourier space. I, I just look, look at the paper, but, but you can use this method under the assumption that you're perturbing your small perturbations to pick out these linearized properties. Uh, you know, people call this quasi-linear uh, approximation. Um, you know, the, that was a classic way of looking at, at these things. So it's still valid. It's still valid because you assume weak perturbations. Josh, could you give some idea like and how you were the, the, the editor? editor? I recommended it as an editor's choice. I really liked the paper. <laughs> so, um, thank you. Um, no, but I'm just curious now. This is really nice. Uh, but how do we choose the mean value and the amplitude of the sign to get the PRC? Because I suppose it will differ, like where you are holding the membrane and the shape might differ. Right. So, so that's that's true. I mean, that's where you, I mean, definitely it's going to be the we show that in the paper. You expect if you hold a cell at a more linear region where there are no active, you'll get one kind of phase response curve, and if you move up, so that's but that's that's actually relatively easy. That's an easy thing, and it still stays within the framework. Of your characterization of the neuron, that it, its phase response filter curve have, can change with, with, with nonlinearities, um, but uh, yes, yeah, so, I mean, I think I think it's 
maybe I didn't answer. No, yeah, actually, you didn't answer. <laughs> I'm just curious, is there a way to determine like how much, what should be the amplitude of my okay, perturbation? Right, okay. So, so yeah, so actually, I, I, that's a question that really, really interests Charlie Wilson. And he's, I think he's, he has a paper coming out about that. You know, this linear approximation, I mean, in theory, you want to give as, as weak as possible uh, you know, perturbation in order for it to, to give you an, a, something, a measurable effect. And that's why 20 picoabs turned out to be enough for GP neurons. Um, uh, but it, it could very well be that under physiological conditions, they get more than that. So the idea is that there's supposed to be a range where this linear approximation, this assumption that this formula is correct, is still valid. And, uh, you know, that's reasonable. I mean, at some point, if it's really a large perturbation, a lot of things can happen. I mean, you can cause the cell to silence. So, so it's, I think it's an empirical question. You want, you, the right, maybe the rigorous way to do it is do it with 20, do it with 10, do it with 40, and make sure you get a region where you're sort of scaled and you get a scaled response. And other related question is that all these uh, experiments are done with like pure tones. Um, but like the examples you showed, even there, even if it's pathologically very strong oscillation, it is still not a precise tone. So it always comes with noise. So yeah, to what extent PRCs would predict, uh, let's say, oscillatory or phase synchronization when the network is driven with some noisy currents? So again, I, I, so first of all, there's also a theory, and this you go, Bart Ehrman tried, I think Charlie, Charlie Spans on some of his papers on this experiment. There's a theory how the noise should behave when you, you do sort of a fit. Um, what is it called? Like um, one of those um, forgotten physics that terminal where you, we change the equation to uh, I'm blanking out. But there's there's a formalism to actually be able to determine what the noise or the corrections for the PRC should look like. And and yeah, I mean, there's always this intrinsic noise. You saw that when I when you try to do it experimentally, the most naive way, you get a big, big scatter. So that has to be calculated. And 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 you know, something very coarse like this, like a distribution of phases where it fires, you still it still remains pretty re reasonable. But we had to put in additional noise. So we we calculated the return map from the mean, you know, from the the fit phase response curve, and then we just threw in some degree of noise based on some criteria to make it. Look nice. So yeah, noise. Noise is always. Uh, I mean, I, I refer again. Refer you to Charlie's tried to d deal with that a little more rigorously. Josh, I have one question. Um, we started with the problem of resting membrane potential and a point source neuron, mm -hmm. which is very convenient to use in a network model. Mm -hmm. Is there much work using this kind of? Formalism in a network to to see what our network would behave. And right. So so I think yes. One of the one of the examples I gave in that paper in two thousand seven. Maybe I should have brought it up just to, to show that if I take two of these ball and stick neurons and I I I, 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 I calculate how they synchronize with each other, and you know two neurons can synchronize either interface and interface. Actually, as you march along, if you march, let's say you assume symmetrically that they're synapses are so much far, far out from the soma, and you might, you actually change from regions of synchrony, anti-synchrony, and exactly as you would expect from the phase response, when it loses that negative lobe, that, me, that is, you can actually, so I'm, the, the argument is yes, you should actually, you can include it, and it, and it, it can account for changes in, in network activity simply by where inputs are on, on the dendrite, um, in principle, I mean, so I, th I think it. I think it's one of the arguments they made in that paper back in the day is that we should we should be able to. Uh, I mean, another aspect of the paper is that I was maybe trying to argue that you don't necessarily have to describe the entire dendritic tree, but you could reduce it to a, a much simpler representation. You know, even a uh, infinite membrane could capture some of the essential aspects of the synchrony, but still give you something of what the danger is contributing, you know, the, the phase, at least the phase delay or something like that. So, so I think it is a useful, it could be a useful extension to, to, to study networks without making it way too hard to simulate everything. Um, so in the basal ganglia, there's a lot of inhibitory connections onto these uh, oscillating populations. Do you do the same kinds of simulations where you um, induce a, 
IPSP rather than EPSP right. with the same kind of energy again. get similar effects. So, okay, so again, as I said, you look at Charlie's papers over tenure, he's got a lot of that. They're clear in Dieter Jaeger's, it's, it doesn't always behave like linear. It doesn't, you know, because the linear approximation actually means that if you give a negative current, then it should be exactly the same. And then there are questions of whether should your perturbations be simulated as conductance changes or, or current changes. And so there are studies where this formula is developed for conductance changes. So th these are all excellent valid questions. And, and you know, there's, you know, worth pursuing or reading about. Okay, it's like questions have dried up. So 